officially to the new content of a lesson two, officially in the um, fatigue and recovery mechanisms of chapter eight. So last time, and you've watched the recap video, it was all about the depletion of fuels, the depletion of phosphate creatine, the depletion of ATP itself, and the depletion of glucose, glycogen, etc. What we're going to talk about today is that buildup of metabolic byproducts. And as we know, the main one that we're going to discuss is, is lactic acid, or lactate, and hydrogen ions. How does that all work? Um, so essentially, we're looking around about page 165 through to 167, and we're going to spend pretty much the entire lesson on it. And then I'm going to leave you with some, some questions and some work, and, and uh, we'll leave it there. So... During today's lesson, and happy to, for you to pause it, write these down, or come back to this at any point, so timestamp the video, but I want you to think about, do you understand the difference between lactate and lactic acid? Why are we talking about lactate potentially being a good thing? I'm going to talk about calcium, and, and the video I show you talks about calcium. So we haven't heard about calcium since you know this time last year, in year 11 PE. What is a lactate shuttle and how does that have anything to do with that second question that was posed? And the word that's going to be thrown around is acidosis. So what is this and how does this affect performance? And hopefully through your learnings of the energy systems, a little bit of background knowledge comes into this and it makes a little bit more sense. I'm going to flip over to the textbook now and we're looking at page 165. Five, moving on from where we left off last time. So, metabolic byproducts, this is in the two anaerobic energy systems. They're the most responsible for the buildup of these byproducts. We are wanting rapid breakdown of ATP. And remember, when phosphate creatine breaks apart, you're going to have some more inorganic phosphates that are floating around the muscle. Okay, So inside that working muscle, in those first number of, of seconds that we're exploding all these ATPs, we've got adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphates floating around. And we know that with too much of the ADP and inorganic phosphates taking up space, that ATP is not within that space, we are decreasing the force in which we can contract our muscles. So a buildup of ADP and a buildup of inorganic phosphate will also lead to a, 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 a buildup of metabolic byproducts. So that's our first thing that we need to think about here is last lesson when I asked students, what do we mean by you know a buildup of metabolic byproducts? And we all straight away went to lactic acid, lactate and hydrogen ions, great, but the first thing we need to talk about is too much ADP, too much inorganic phosphate, taking up space, it makes the contraction of muscles less forceful. Part of the reason why it makes it less forceful is to do with this calcium, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. These are some things that I think are very, very confusing because some of us don't remember them. We've erased them from our memory from early last year. So I'm going to flip over to a video and a video you would have seen last year. I'm going to let it play. I'm going to pause and skip some bits and, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. So that's talking there about what we mentioned last week in terms of central fatigue, the central nervous system, and those messages actually becoming blocked. That can become an issue when a muscle was trying to contract. Then I'm going to fast forward to this. This is the inside deep in that muscle where the actin and myosin are cross bridging on each other. Pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. And we know that muscles only move in one direction, the agonist and antagonist. So a bicep will flex an elbow while the tricep extends the elbow. So this movement of muscle fibers that we spoke about in depth last year only can occur because... And ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. 
An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. Okay, so, so far, no issues. Everything seems like it's moving smoothly. We know about ATP and everything there is absolutely fantastic. What I need to fast forward to now is how is calcium's role taking a part in all of this? And what it does is calcium actually helps allow this actin to become attached by myosin. Of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross-bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils, where they trigger a muscle contraction. Okay, we'll leave it there. I know that's a fairly in-depth look at that video, but pretty important. So when we scroll down here, in order for a muscle contraction to occur, there must be a stimulus from the brain. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, like was just shown in that video, releases calcium to allow the muscle to actually attach onto itself. There must be calcium in the muscle. So if we run out of calcium, then this process will not work whatsoever. And ATP must be available. So if there's no ATP, that means that the actin and myosin can't attach onto each other. So these three items here are pretty critical when we think about there has to be things that allow this process to take place. And so if we have a restriction of brain signals for that first one. If we have an impaired amount of calcium or the release of calcium, or we have an impaired amount of ATP, we are going to seem fatigued. Now we move on to talking about lactic acid, lactate, and hydrogen ions. And the first thing that comes up is this talk about burn and pain. And I know that I have informally also associated the, the presence of lactate and hydrogen ions inside the muscle with a burning sensation. However, we need to make sure that it's very clear what it is that we talk about in that burning sensation. What is lactic acid, what is lactate, and what are hydrogen ions? So, we talk about DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. This usually happens the day after or even two days after a workout bout of exercise. And when it's a high intensity workout bout of exercise and the muscles have actually suffered little tears and damages and need repairing, which ultimately leads to stronger and larger muscles, that feeling of pain is part of DOMS, but there's also the presence of lactic acid within the muscles that we need to take into consideration. Is it fatiguing? Is it positive? Lactic acid is continuously being produced. Right now, as you sit there watching this video, lactic acid is being produced. However, what we know is that people are able to complete ultra endurance events. And so if lactic acid is so bad and those events are going for multiple, multiple hours, how are marathon runners and triathletes able to continue to work for such a long period of time? We know that lactate production can actually help our exercise rates because lactate can be converted back into glycogen. We saw it last lesson, we spoke about it during energy systems. What we need to really understand is the lactate inflection point, the lactate threshold. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a quick video and then I'm gonna come back and talk about this diagram in a little bit more depth. For the lactate profile, we're gonna take small blood samples. Um, and measure your body's response to the exercise. So we're going to start at a real easy pace, like a recovery run pace. we we'll slowly, incrementally work our way up until we get to you to a very hard pace. Each time we're going to take a finger stick to get your blood lactate. 
a heart rate, and a rating of perceived exertion. From that, we'll set your training zones, and you can start training smarter and hopefully get faster. Okay, so what they're saying here is that somebody is on a treadmill in very, very controlled conditions, and that treadmill is moving at a relatively easy and slow pace, four kilometers per hour. That person has a level of lactate inside their blood. And we know that the lactate is being produced inside the muscles and transferred into the blood. We always have some level of lactate inside our blood and our muscles. It's never at zero because all three energy systems are always working. As we increase the speed of the treadmill, the amount of lactate in the blood will increase but to a manageable level. And as it continues to increase in speed, it's also increasing here, but to a manageable level. And what you'll see by this diagram is roughly around about that 12 kilometers per hour. That person is still at a manageable speed on that treadmill. That means that an increase from where the blood lactate level was to now is not significant. However, when we make that next jump, that next jump in speed means that there has been a huge increment in the amount of lactate inside the blood. That means that the amount that was being managed in the muscle site can no longer be managed. The amount of lactate being produced far superior to the amount of lactate being removed and dealt with. This is the lactate inflection point. And when you put somebody in a controlled environment on a treadmill and continually take blood samples at each speed, as well as heart rate, we can look at how hard is that person working to try and manage the lactate that's being produced in their body? How much is that person relying on the anaerobic glycolysis system being dominant or just working in the background to give me some extra energy. Usually this happens when somebody is at about 85% of their maximum heart rate. Once we hit this point, once LIP is exceeded and we continue to work above that level, the amount of lactate that we end up with in our blood and our body is unmanageable. It's exceeded ventilation rapidly rises. The body is desperate to try and bring more and more oxygen in to deal with what's going on. We wanna try and continue to work. However, we wanna delay the onset of fatigue as well, okay? So what happens here is glycolysis. When we go through glycolysis and our body is creating um, energy through the glycolysis process, we end up with pyruvic acid. That pyruvic acid also has with it some hydrogen ions. And when hydrogen ions bond back with the pyruvic acid, we get lactic acid. Lactic acid is actually lactate and hydrogen ions. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, we continue. The hydrogen ions are an acid. So when the muscle itself is starting to produce a large amount of hydrogen ions, the muscle is actually going through acidosis. The internal environment is becoming more and more acidic. We can't stay within homeostasis. The body wants to try and get rid of some of these hydrogen ions. So what does it do? It combines hydrogen ions with oxygen to produce water, which makes sense. H from the hydrogen ions, O from the oxygen makes H2O, which we know is water. But we need a significant amount of oxygen to be able to try and get the amount of hydrogen ions that we're producing and turn it into oxygen. So if we were to decrease the speed again back on our treadmill, 
with that increased ventilation, some of that increased amount of oxygen would be able to try and oxidise some of these excess hydrogen ions and lactate, lactic acid production. However, not all of it is going to be able to happen. So if we can get an athlete to train at this level that's manageable, they can train for much, much longer. But the moment that that athlete tips over that level and hits their lactate inflection point, we know the muscle is not going to be able to sustain the amount of force and contraction that it has been. <laughs> One of the other things that we know that happens is that lactate itself can actually be transferred over to the liver and can be created back into glycogen. This is the lactate shuttle model. When this happens, we can actually get another burst of energy because we've created another source of energy. And not only that, we've created that source from something that was fatiguing us and clogging up space. So when we have enough oxygen and we can try and work with some of these hydrogen ions, we can also then work with some of the excess lactate. When this happens, we can actually continue to exercise for longer. So if the body is able to continue to work under the, the pressure of dealing with lactate and hydrogen ions, for longer, then that athlete will have a better chance of winning a race or outperforming another athlete. And this is what training does. If people know what point their body will hit their lactate inflection point and they can work just under that level, they will be able to work for longer than somebody who doesn't understand their body, pushes it too hard too early and ends up hitting that lactate inflection point and is now dealing with their body trying to manage large amounts of acid and lactate and shuttle it over to become excess glycogen. What I need you guys to understand is the difference between aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis is only down at this pyruvic acid stage and the sufficient and insufficient oxygen question. So the body is constantly making the decision around which energy system will be predominant based around how much oxygen do I have in my body. And if you are able to manage the amount of oxygen in your body, or you are able to get your body to a point where you can bring in and utilize more oxygen, then we will spend more time at more intensity levels in the aerobic glycolysis system and less time spent in the anaerobic glycolysis system and creating this fatiguing mechanism. What I would like you guys to do is to create some notes after you've watched this video. Make sure that you have a really good understanding of the lactate, the hydrogen ions, the hydrogen ions being an acid, the lactate being able to become a fuel again, lactic acid being both of those items, and what lactate inflection point is. And then start thinking about towards the end of this lesson, what would you do to try and manage lactate and hydrogen ions? Is it passive rest? Is it active rest where you want to keep your heart rate slightly elevated and your ventilation rate slightly elevated to get more oxygen in? Or do you want to give your body fully rest in conditions to try and manage these conditions? I'm going to come back with one more video which asks you to complete a practical activity and that practical activity is going to get you to experience and think about how your body feels under these conditions.